And a very warm welcome to our service this morning. In a moment, Brooke, our youth and family worker, is going to preach on doubt, fear and anxiety. Uh, but before that, I'm going to ask George to bring us our reading. The reading is taken from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an internal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we were clothed we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that is what is mortal may be swallowed up by this life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen, rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello everyone. Um, today we're going to be reading through 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The lectionary is from verses 6 to 17, but we'll be going through the whole of chapter 5 today um, because I really love the whole chapter. As I read through chapter 5, there were four themes that came out of the chapter for me as I felt God was leading me. Those are, number one, Paul's earnest desire for heaven. Number two, Paul's striving to please God. Number three, the Holy Spirit's effect on Paul's ministry. And the fourth and final thing that came up for me was um, that God is worthy of our entire lives. When I first opened the chapter, the first thing that struck me was Paul's language. He starts off by saying, now we know. I love the certainty of Paul in his address. He knows beyond a doubt about the hope that we as Christians have in heaven. And I wonder that as we begin to explore this chapter together today, where are you on the certainty spectrum? What are your doubts? fears and anxieties as you've woken up on this Sunday morning? Where do you need to ask God to help you with certainty to say, as Paul did, now I know to God's promises for us? 
I would love it if you could take a moment to think about this. This might mean pausing the video and having a time of silence with God. What do you need to know today to help you move forward in your faith and relationship with Christ? It might mean trying to really comprehend who God is and where he dwells, his power and his mightiness over all creation. Give your worries and cares to him before we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal more of his word for us today. Okay, so let's get stuck into our chapter. So my first point that really spoke to me was Paul's earnest desire for heaven. In verse 2, he says that he has a longing to be clothed with our heavenly righteousness. And in verse 4, he says, so that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life. It's a challenge to hear Paul speaking as though his entire being just wants to be unified completely with Christ in heaven. As I read this to myself, I thought, do I earnestly desire heaven? Or am I too comfortable and familiar with this earth? Now, of course, this doesn't mean we purposely seek out affliction, but neither should we dedicate our lives to comfort. In Matthew 8, 20, Jesus says, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of the man has nowhere to lay his head. We think of Matthew, who is a tax collector, and very likely to have wealth on his side. He most likely was a betrayal to his fellow Jews as he stepped into the Roman side and took money from his own people into the hands of their oppressors. Before Matthew was called by Jesus to follow him, we can imagine the wealth and comfort was a big part of his identity which is why I think Matthew took the time to record these words of Jesus. Matthew would have left it, would have left all of that behind him. For some of the disciples, it would have meant leaving behind family or careers. For Matthew in particular, I can imagine it probably meant leaving behind the comfort of his old life. And here, Matthew sees Jesus, who created the earth, and yet has nowhere to even lay his head in his very own creation. It's so important that our perspective changes as followers of Christ, that we look to heaven instead of the riches of this earth. And we don't just see this in theory, we see this practically and authentically in Paul, in the disciples, and especially in Jesus Christ. My second point and the second theme that really um, came to me while reading the, the chapter was Paul's striving to please God. In verse 9 he says, we make it our goal to please him. And verse 10 he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul has such an awareness of putting God first and foremost before everything. We see the Spirit of God working throughout Paul. As Christians today, we marvel at Paul because he didn't just talk the talk, but he walked the walk. In other words, he really lived how he spoke. We see that Jesus was always doing the will of the Father and pleasing him. He did not beg people to follow him. He did not ask people to accept him. He accepted the people he met because of his grace and compassion. In John 8, 29, Jesus says, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. We are to do the same, to not just say or think we should put God first and please God, but actively and authentically please God by putting him first and foremost in everything. Paul also talks about the fear of God in verse 11. The reason Paul is in his position is because God chose him despite the fact that he persecuted God's own people. His grace saved God. 
But Paul also sees that God is God. He does what he pleases. He is a loving God, but he is also to be feared. When we think back to verse 10 and his judgment seat, we should be in a place of complete surrender and reverence. Fear does not motivate us. God's grace does. But fear of God does bring us back to having the right heart attitude towards a holy and mighty God. Um, The third theme that came up for me was the Holy Spirit's very obvious effect on Paul's ministry. While Paul is longing for heaven and strives to please God, we see that he's able to do all of these things because of the Holy Spirit's power in him. In verse 14, he says, For Christ's love compels us. As we all know, it's not always easy to love, whether that's some friends, or that's work colleagues, or even other Christians. But Jesus' Holy Spirit is able to work in our weakness and helps us to be compelled, not in good works for the sake of good works, but in true love that exists only in Jesus and who helps us. Paul goes on to say in verse 15, and he died for all those who live should no longer live for themselves. This verse is similar to Paul's remarkable comment in Philippians 1.21, where he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we know Christ, everything changes. We leave behind selfishness and put God and others before ourselves. This is actually a really difficult thing, especially for me. But Jesus is showing me more and more every day, step by step, that his power is able to conquer all my weaknesses. 2 Timothy Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 says, but understand this, that in the last days there will be times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self. And we see this increasingly. I certainly feel it in my generation with the wave of social media and all the implications that that brings. We live in a society that is obsessed and in love with self. We as Christians are called to be different, to be known for how we love one another. John 13, 35 says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I truly believe this is a huge battle that the worldwide church is facing. We are failing to love one another supernaturally in a, in a way that makes the world confused. Verse 17 in chapter 5 finishes this point perfectly. It says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. For most of us watching, we can retell our testimonies and the day we met Jesus. In all of our testimonies, we will all be able to identify the moment where we did like a 180 degree turn. We were one way. And then we were another. We were a decaying creation, but then Jesus came in and his grace and mercy made us new. I love hearing testimonies. They're always such an encouragement because of the change that Jesus does in people. My ending question is, are we continuing to be examples of a new creation where the Holy Spirit is so obvious in our lives and so direct in leading our lives that people can't be helped but drawn in. My final point is that God is worthy of our entire lives. So far Paul has made some pretty challenging remarks about what we desire, what we strive for and the Holy Spirit's imprint on our lives. All of this is something we can take away today and pray into. We can ask God to break down barriers to allow him to overflow in the areas where we are weak. The last verse in the chapter we're looking at today 
was incidentally one of the verses that caused me to recognise who Jesus was when coming to him and asking him to accept me when I became a Christian nine years ago. Verse 21 says, God made him who has no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's such a loaded verse, rich in meaning and theology, which could be based on an entire sermon itself. But it also brings us to a place of total surrender of worship to our God, who chose his perfect blameless son to be sin, to taste sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. If this doesn't cause us to stop all that we are doing and to simply sit and stare at God's mighty and incredible goodness, then we need to ask God to soften our hearts and to help us. Let's end in a prayer as we have discussed all of these things and ask God to graciously meet with us right in this moment. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for that verse that we end with today. We thank you, Lord, that everything points back to you. Lord, I thank you for what it cost you when you suffered and died for us. Jesus, we can never repay you but we can give all of our lives to you. We can surrender our entire lives to you, God. God, I pray that you would soften our hearts, wherever we are, however we have arrived today, Lord, I just pray that you would meet with us in this moment. Lord, help us in our desires. Help us to think about what we really strive for. Help us to think about the Holy Spirit's imprint on our lives and and help us to think about the way that we approach you and worship you. God, we just want to live for you. We want to please you. We want to lift you high. So God, I pray that you would just soften the hearts of each person watching this video today. Break down barriers, Lord, and help us to overflow with your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love and for your grace. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah.
Today, I know that uh, Brooke's words had uh, particular significance for me. I hope that God uh, spoke to you uh, in a similar way. I'm going to bless you and uh, let you get on uh, with your uh, uh, with your day and all that God has for you. Uh, I'm going to use uh, some words of a, of a Celtic blessing. O oh God, make clear to us each road. O oh God, make safe to us each steep. When we stumble, hold us. When we fall, lift us up. When we are hard pressed with evil, deliver us. And bring us at last to your glory. As the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Ten thousand years, bright shine.